in the headlines. President Buhari approves deployment of more security operatives to address insecurity in Imo State. Nigeria ranks first in Africa and sixth globally among 30 high tuberculosis burden countries. CBN leaves benchmark interest rates at 11.5%, says rising food prices will moderate on deliberate actions. Sri Lanka deploys troops as protests erupt among thousands of people queuing daily for scarce fuel. Hello and welcome to Trust TV News Update. I'm Zainab Bada. Hello and welcome. President Muhammad Buhari has approved the deployment of more security personnel, arms and ammunition to Imo State to address the security situation. Imo State Governor Hope Ozodima said this while fielding questions from State House reporters after a meeting with the President at the Presidential Villa in Abuja. President Buhari had summoned the Governor over recent security developments in his state. For me. And uh, I've gone to see him and um, raised some issues which we have uh, adequately addressed, particularly the resurgence of insecurity in the Southeast and uh, what is required to ensure that uh, is properly controlled. We discussed all that and um, he took seriously my recommendations and indeed I can tell you he immediately gave approval to all that, which includes uh, increase in manpower to security agencies and then uh, uh, other logistic supports, ranging from uh, additional arms and ammunition. And um, also we are making use of our local vigilante and the involvement of uh, community leaders to ensure that uh, through community arrangement, additional security is provided to the people. Bandits invade Agban community uh, in the Kora local government area of Kaduna State. An eyewitness, Richard Garba, told Trust TV News that the terrorists came in large numbers, shooting sporadically and killing 19 people, including two military officers who responded to distress calls from the community. He said many houses were burnt and valuables worth millions of naira were destroyed. Those who sustained injuries are taken to the hospital for treatment. Now, youths from the affected community on Monday resorted to roadblocks, stopping and searching vehicles that are plying the road. The eyewitness said police in the process of dismantling the roadblocks by the youth shot a taxi driver, a resident of Katsit in Zongokata local government area, a border community with Kafanchen Tower in Jama'a local government area. This triggered protest by the youth to the Kafanchen police area command demanding for justice. The protest later turned to violence in the area, but security operatives were quick to restore law and order in the area. Meanwhile, Kaduna state government has declared 24-hour curfew in Jamaa and Kaura local government areas of the state to have absolute control of the situation. Elsewhere, Zamfara state government says it has employed about 4,200 community protection guards to tackle cases of kidnapping, banditry and other crimes in the state. Information Commissioner Ibrahim Dosara and his internal security and home affairs counterpart Mamad Zafi in a press conference in Kaduna on the security situation of the state says the move is aimed at curtailing security challenges bedeviling the state. Fatima Salalado has more. The commissioner says the community protection guards comprised of ex-servicemen, volunteer men and other patriotic citizens in Zamfara State to complement the effort of security operatives for confronting these bandits in their enclave with a view to curtailing the menace. The government also recruited 4,200 community protection guards, CPG, comprising of our ex-servicemen, volunteer, able-bodied men, and other patriotic citizens with Zamfara State at their heart to support the security operatives to confront these bandits in their enclaves with a view to curtailing the unhealthy situation. 
it may interest you, the members of the pen profession, to note that these 4,200 CPGs have already commenced the basic training and are now collaborating with our security operatives in chasing the bandits. The Commissioner for Internal Security and Home Affairs, Mohamed Ibrahim Safi, says though the initial dialogue with the bandits yielded relative peace as majority of them succumbed to the peace process, but the few ones refused to lay their arms and are still attacking innocent citizens in the state. He says that government is on top of the situation. Uh, you could remember the concept, the Dr. Bello Mohamed Matolle's concept of uh, Zaruga in the various senatorial districts because the rehabilitation in this case is for both. The, the, those who accepted our sulhu and they join us, they had the difficulty in remaining in the very dark terrain. And then those who suffered from the activities uh, of bandits, it is uh, going on so that they will be fully integrated. I give you a situation where very recently a bandit on his own came to me to say that uh, he is tired of that living in the bush. And let me tell you, he surrendered his weapon to me. I don't know whether he, he has taken me, me alone, not to talk that he went to His Excellency, which will uh, reflect some pecuniary intentions. I mean, if he had gone straight with his weapons to His Excellency, maybe he would be thinking he would be instantly rewarded with some uh, he just came to me as a, a person who felt within him something divine came to him that his living is not a human living. The commissioners expressed hope that the state will regain back its last glory as one of the most peaceful states in the country. Fatima Salaladen, Trust TV News, Kaduna. A mayor of Kefi, Shehuya Musa and Esu Karuduka Panya Baba say peace between farmers and herders is imperative for sustainable development in their domains. The traditional leaders, rulers rather, said this when a team on peace advocacy visited them in their palaces in Kefi and Karu Nasara State. The report. The two traditional rulers of Kefi and Karu in Nasarawa State, Shehuya Musa and Luka Panyababa, respectively, while commending the effort of the peace advocacy team, stressed that peace is paramount in every human endeavor. They said on their part, they are doing everything possible to ensure that residents of their domains continue to live in peace with one another, irrespective of their tribe, religion, and political affiliations. They call on people to, as a matter of tolerance to one another, treat issues without sentiment for the sustenance of peace in the society. The monarchs maintain that history has it that farmers and herders were like people of the same family, thereby advise them to remember history and live like before for the benefit of all. <laughs> This thing you are doing will bring more understanding among herders and farmers as well as peace in the society. As you said in your speech, farmers and herders are living in peace, but the latest changes in the society bring some misunderstandings. Before now, farmers and herders were very close to each other. Farmers applied fertilizers to get more yield and allow herders to use the waste in the farm. I remember our grandparents, while going to farm, they don't go with food but drink milk from Fulanis. I can remember many Fulanis. Even those that live here, when my grandparents were in position of leadership. Right from where we went, old the peace advocacy team also had interaction with farmers and herders in villages of Gunduma, Angwanjaba, Basa, Imkaru, Kefi, and Kokona local government areas of the state. We are important of peace, was told by the leader of the team, who is an aide to the National State Governor, Khadija Adamu. We should all love ourselves and be our brother's keepers. We should try our best to always be on the same page and help one another. 
God made some people farmers while others herders. Tracing back to history, if a farmer sees a herder stops at his farm, he becomes happy and it's the other way around for the herders too. They always wish to help each other because they need one another in terms of food and fertilizer. Some leaders of herders and farmers who also spoke during the interaction attributed the frequent crisis between farmers and herders to the increase in population, which reduces grazing reserves and farmlands, calling on government to intervene in that regard. Abu Bakr Abdullahi, Trust TV News, Lafia. There you go. Now, World Health Organization says Nigeria ranks first in Africa and sixth globally among the 30 high tuberculosis burden countries, with 18 Nigerians dying from TB every hour. Director General of World Health Organization Tedros Ghebreyesus stated this while presenting the World Health Organization Global Report 2020, ahead of this year's World Tuberculosis Day marked every March 24th. According to the report, 47 Nigerians develop active tuberculosis every hour, with seven of them being children. Noting that for the first time in over a decade, TB deaths increased in 2020. The World Health Organization said COVID-19 has reversed gains of 66 million people saved since 2000 from TB, lamenting that an extra 1.1 billion US dollars needed for research and development annually and also called for an urgent investment of resources, support, care, and information into the fight against tuberculosis. 2022 National and International Adolescent Health Week is commemorated with stakeholders kickstarting the week-long participatory events and ministerial press briefing in Abuja. Trust TV's Aisha Salu reports. Good population health begin at the adolescent stage and increase attention given to their health, despite looking healthy in any community. This is one of the major points at the International Adolescent Health Week Ministerial Press Briefing. The welcome and keynote address by the Federal Minister of Health and Minister of State for Health noted that, working together towards improving the health and well-being of adolescents by several engagement through health-related activities and education, while seeking to incorporate their input into the IAHW plan, will go a long way in providing a lasting solution to the health concerns of adolescents in the country. At the last national and international adolescent week, let us not forget to discuss deeply the need to provide adolescents with comprehensive, appropriate, confidential and reliable quality services. There is also a huge need for policy implementation that uses adolescent self-reported data to help assess the quality of preventive care provided to the youth. I'm pleased to inform you that we have made some modest progress. The National Adolescent Health and Development Technical Working Group has been repositioned and inaugurated for better performance with membership drawn from relevant stakeholders, including organizations led by young people. Additionally, we created a budget line for adolescents, developed a two-year national costed work plan, and prioritized activities for implementation in 2022. Stakeholders stress their organizational commitment towards ensuring the health welfare of adolescents in Nigeria as they constitute significant proportions in a nation's building. Where are we with the commitment to end preventable death? The commitment to help adolescents thrive by acting on social determinants of health. Where are we today with the commitment to provide our adolescents with a living environment. So adolescents and young girls and boys they can access to to HIV uh, testing and services close to the to, to them. So I think like working all of us together, thinking innovation in partnerships in private sector, we can really make the the difference. And I'd like to wrap up by saying adolescents are standing at the crossroad between childhood and adulthood. As they stand at this crossroad, so do the society stand. 
so do Nigeria stand. So we need to invest in them, we need to trust them that they got a lot of energy, innovation, ingenuity in them. And with that, we can have not just a smarter society, but a, a future that everyone will be proud of. As an adolescent, I can proudly say that adolescence is an amazing time. Adolescents are leaders of now and the future, and we should be treated as such. It is an accomplishment to have an entire week dedicated to adolescent health and well-being. The theme of this year's Adolescent Health Week, which is transition from, adulthood, from adolescence to adulthood, from a pre-pandemic era to a life shaped by the pandemic, is very unerring because now more than ever, adolescent health cannot be understressed. The COVID-19 pandemic halted plans for 2020, but in 2021, while still battling with the pandemic, which had high mortality in adults, the theme of IAHW, Adolescent Resilience, in the face of a pandemic, attempted to refocus attention on the need to not ignore the adolescents. Aisha Salehu, Trust TV News, Abuja. You're watching Trust TV News update coming up. How rape of teenager by cousin tears family apart. Details of this story and more after the break this day. <music> This is Trust TV, documenting the Nigerian story. Welcome back. If you are just joining us, this is Trust TV News Update. Here are our top stories. President Muhammad Buhari approves the deployment of more security personnel, arms and ammunition to Imo states to address the security situation. World Health Organization says Nigeria ranks first in Africa and sixth globally among the 30 high tuberculosis burden countries, with 18 Nigerians dying from TB every hour. Still ahead, armed policemen on Tuesday morning took over the Cross River State House of Assembly. The policemen drawn from the anti-kidnapping squad and regular policemen were also seen around the routes leading to the House of Assembly, restricting movement into the Assembly complex on Diamond Hill. Their presence followed the High Court ruling on Monday, sacking 20 lawmakers in the state for defecting from the People's Democratic Party to the All Progressive Congress. Now, alleged rape of a 14-year-old Safara Usani of Maikoni Nasara village in my Adwa local government area of Katsina State is tearing the family of the victim apart. The victim's family are pointing accusing fingers to her cousin for the rape and her pregnancy. Safara Usani and her mother, Zainab Habu, were also ejected out of her late father's house. The rape case involving members of the same family has seriously affected the lifelong relationship that exists between them. Abdullah Yamadi followed this tragic story. Safara Usani, who is now bearing a child, was a JS3 student in Daura, was raped and impregnated by her cousin brother, Mati, sometimes in 2020. He raped me, and uh, thereafter, I was impregnated, and of course, I am bearing a child. Mati is responsible for all these problems. He impregnated me. Trauma and poverty pushed Safara U out of school, as she now seeks the intervention of Human Rights Network of Nigeria and the Association of International Women Lawyers, Kazuna State Chapters, at least to reduce trauma, stigmatization, and give her one-and-a-half-year-old child, Muazzam, a sense of belonging. Though Safara Usani dragged her suitor Mati to a Sharia court in Dora, the judge advised the parties who are from the same family to settle out of court as the Sharia court lacks the competence to listen or pass judgment 
on rape cases. Instead of this advice by the Shara court judge to serve as a stepping stone towards fostering unity and understanding among the family, the situation further deteriorated with each party pointing a chosen finger at the other. We have made several attempts to resolve this issue at a family level, but it failed. We tried to get them married again. It failed. From there, we'll take up the issue. We either go and uh, arrest him and then uh, proceed and uh, prosecute him for rape, or if he decides to marry her, then that is well, all well and fine with us. We are now trying to go and see Galadima, probably if there is a possibility for she and the Mati that impregnated her. Because from all instances, we notice that um, Mati, the man, uh, the suspect, or I can say the one that impregnated the girl, that he paid some money to do the naming ceremony. So that means there is a link already he has accepted. In another attempt, both the victim, Safara Usani, Harandi Suto Mati, their relatives and the ward heads of Maikoni Nasarawa villages were invited to a meeting by the officials of the two human rights organizations to sort out the problems with a view to ensuring its amicable resolution for justice, fairness and peace to prevail. After several hours of interfacing, the Randi Suto Mati admitted to have carnal knowledge of Safara Usani and accepted to continue to take good care as well as the responsibilities of his child whom he named after Muazzam. Hey. You see, I know her. She is my cousin's sister. I willingly take responsibility and I promise to do all I could to make my child a role model. But I cannot promise marrying Safara because I don't have anything to marry her now. I don't have the money, so I can't marry her. The confessional statement prompted FIDA and the Human Rights Network of Nigeria has mustered chapters to document the process for possible legal action. On the issue of ejecting Safara Usani and her mother Zainab Habu from their ancestral home, the ward heads of the communities promised to intervene and review the issues at stake. It could be recalled that rape cases are increasing at an alarming rate in Katsuma State, especially in local communities, a situation that calls for a holistic approach by political actors and other stakeholders to save this and future generations from serious calamities. Abdullahi Ismayamadi, Crossed Television News, Katsuma. There you go, quite a tragic one indeed. Now, away from that, the police setting committee of the Central Bank of Nigeria has retained the monetary policy rate, which measures interest rate at 11.5%. The CBN governor, Godu Mifeli, stated this on Monday while addressing journalists after, after the committee's meeting at the CBN headquarters in Abuja. The Apex Bank governor said the committee members voted to hold key rates steady while the committee also unanimously retained key rates with the asymmetric corridor of plus 100 over 700 basis points around the MPR and retain the cash reserve ratio at 27.5%, as well as the liquidity ratio at 30%. Mefela said the MPC remains concerned that the global situation of rising prices may continue in the near term, but may begin to moderate if deliberate and urgent actions are taken by both monetary and fiscal authorities to correct rising inflation. And on the foreign scene, Sri Lanka has ordered its military to post soldiers at hundreds of petrol stations to help distribute fuel after a sudden rise in prices of key commodities and the accompanying shortages forced tens of thousands of people to queue for hours. The Indian Ocean Island nation is battling a foreign exchange crisis that forced the devaluation of its currency and hit payments for essential imports such as food, medicine and fuel, prompting the government to approach the International Monetary Fund. Military spokesman Ntala Premaratne said the decision to position troops near petrol pumps and kerosene supply points come after three elderly people dropped dead during their wait in long queues. Tension over the scarcity of supplies has led to sporadic violence among residents jostling to buy fuel and other essential items. And that's it on News Update. Do not forget to follow us across all our social media platforms. 
I'm Zainab Bala. Thank you for watching.